Hello and welcome to the Glad You Knew Football Show. I'm Reese Ryan and here with me is Christian Andreri and Evan Urbina. Today we are super excited to speak to Central Coast Mariners boss Alan Stadjic or Stadge about the role of an A-League coach. We speak about how coaching around the world has more things in common than are different. We also hear about what responsibilities he has during the week and what advice he gives to young players. We love and admire Alan and his resilience and his motivation to take Central Coast Mariners back to the top of the A-League. Wait, that's above victory. Oh, we can't have that. But I think you'll be glad you knew Alan Stadjic. So let's get stuck in with another Glad You Knew football show. You've spoken about in the past how much you've enjoyed your coaching career more than your playing career. That's probably because of the two knee reconstructions you've had. When you think about, though, your early career at Blacktown Workers, has your career in football been everything you imagined? Yeah, it has. It has in some ways. You know, it wasn't much to beat my playing career. So. <laughs> Uh, That's a bit harsh. <laughs> I've had a little bit more success in uh, my coaching career. No, nah, but look, I just remember as a, as a young kid, I can't remember what age, would have been about nine or ten, and, you know, hearing the, the term, you can be a professional footballer, and I, I still remember asking my father well, what that sort of meant, and he said that people actually get paid to play, and that just <laughs> blew me away. Like, you actually get paid to do something you love. I I couldn't comprehend the concept that people got paid to play games. So, you know, it was definitely an ambition and a dream of mine to, to be involved in football full time and, and have that as my career and, and hobby and passion all rolled into one. So, you know, I've been pretty fortunate that way. So you studied um, sports science and were a PE teacher. So has being a teacher helped you and given you an advantage at, to become an A-League coach and in terms of understanding people and players? Yeah, I hope it has. Um, it's definitely a good grounding. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of skills that go into teaching, um, planning and preparation and, and organisation and you know, lots of meetings. I've tried to steer away from those. <laughs> as teachers love meetings. So there's a lot of skills that you bring to the table apart from actual learning how to deal with people and, and the learning processes that go on within humans and, and trying to individualise that and and trying to find that spark of motivation in, in different people. So there's, there's obviously a lot of commonality um, between teaching and coaching. And you know, I spent a large portion of my coaching career um, coaching young kids as well. So, you know, I was at Hill Sports High School for about 12 years from 2003 to 2014, coaching, you know, kids from year seven to year 12, both boys and girls. And you know, it was, a, it was a great job for me. I loved it and met so many wonderful young kids, but just got to learn even more about how they improved and how they learned and just getting their feedback on, you know, whether they were learning, improving, whether they enjoyed the sessions and, and that kind of stuff. So, Alan, you just relieved you didn't have us in the classroom. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking more on the <laughs> with uh, coaching, but yeah, nah. I look, every kid's different, so... You know, as a PE teacher, so I wasn't too too fixated on being in a classroom. I love being outside and kicking a ball around and throwing a ball around and, and seeing kids have fun because that's what I like doing. Because when I think about it with teaching and, and coaching, it's almost a parallel, really. And I think about the responsibilities of a coach. And, yeah, we can't imagine being an A-League coach and what you have to do in your job. It's not really a typical nine-to-five job, is it? No, it's not. It's not. I, I don't even consider it a job sometimes. I, I don't tell too many people that because you still want to get paid. But oh, look, just as I said at the beginning, like being involved in football first uh, full time is a privilege. Um, there's not many people who get to go to work and, and truly love what they're doing and would almost do it for nothing. So, you know, I'm sure the person who goes into the bank and is a bank teller doesn't really love that every day or laying bricks or whatever. So, you know, it's a real it's a real privilege to be involved in sport. I think any sport full time, whether you're playing, coaching, even administrating, it's, you know, they really are the things that bring you uh, happiness, but also so many others. You know, it is it is a challenging job in saying that there are there are different elements to, to I guess, a normal job and and looking after people is 
is the most challenging of all. So any job where you've got a responsibility for other people are, for me, the most challenging job. So, you know, whether it's CEO, whether it's, you know, a politician, whether it's a coach, you've all, you're always trying to weigh up, you know, and balance balance equations on on the greater good and trying to look after as many people as you can as often as you can and you know quite often in all those roles you know we joked around about Dan Andrews at the beginning but quite often in those roles you're making tough decisions where that are unpopular that are not liked by an individual but they're decisions you're making for the greater good so from that perspective it's it's emotionally challenging and can be draining for the most part, it's it's a fantastic job, and as I said, we're we're really lucky and fortunate to be involved in, in the sport and in a, in, in a career we love, and you know, just happens to be football. So, what is what are the responsibilities on you as a A League coach? Oh, look, there's obviously a lot of responsibilities. Um, you know, they range from even right now in the off season, um, recruitment. Um, even just yesterday, we had a a planning and, and periodization type session with all the staff trying to look forward to the new season on, on you know, what we're going to do to, to ensure that we hit the ground running. So, you know, looking at all the different elements of sports science and medical and, and coaching and planning what the sessions would look like and, and focus focuses for the session, um, individualising as many uh, programs and, and um, issues as we can for, for players. And then obviously it goes to to training sessions, looking after budgets, you know, all those kinds of things. But, yeah, the, the job is extensive and wide ranging but as i said the majority the majority of, of the jobs are are fun to do and they're enjoyable uh for me the most enjoyable part is the actual game on the weekend and training sessions i love especially the last couple of years just love going to training and seeing plan come to life and and something that you've thought about in a training session come to life and, and be successful and then the transfer of that into a game seeing something that was whether it was my idea or someone else's idea bringing it to life and that being effective in a game, you know, is something that gives you a bit of joy, really. And being in the off season at the moment, I can imagine that you're you're picking the pieces through recruitment and what plays you can pick up. But I think our audience would love to know what is the main difference between a, an A League coach and say a coach from abroad. Because when I think about the the big coaches, the Klops, the the Guardiola's. I've got a love affair at the moment with Roberto Di Zerbi and Syria uh, Allen, but we'll we'll leave that there. <laughs> yeah, but we'll if, find that if, like, yeah. <laughs> if if Pep doesn't love a right back, he just goes out in the transfer window and spends fifty million. I don't know about the Central Coast. I don't think you have fifty million to go and buy a right back because we are in a salary cap. So how do you combat this lack of resources and? because you don't have that luxury, do you have to adapt your approach to get the best out of players through your philosophy or do you have to adapt to you, they get the best out of your players? Yeah, look, it's a, that's a fairly complex question, but I guess as a, as a starting point, uh, for me, every <laughs> single coaching environment has more things in common uh, than are different. So I don't, I don't really care whether you're coaching under sevens uh, under 12s, under 15s, under 20s, under whatever, Manchester City, Central Coast Mariners, A-League, W-League, boys, girls. For me, it doesn't matter. I'd say that 90, 95% of the things are the same. Players want to enjoy themselves. They want to learn. And most of them want to win. Um, so so depends on the age as to what the actual focus is. But, but I think there's a lot more in common uh, than, than what people think. And... and Added to that, um, you know, I, I would say that just because Manchester City and, and Central Coast um, are different in terms of finances doesn't mean that the problems, they have less problems. They just have different problems. You know, you, you're at Manchester City and you've got some of the best players in the world who are paid millions of dollars to play football and they're on the bench. And you've got to manage that ego. Um, you know, at Central Coast, we might have these other issues like you mentioned about finances and then you go to a different team and they might have other issues about, you know, their ability to recruit. So it doesn't really matter where you go at any point in time. Every single football team, and I'd, go, I'd stretch it as far as every, every single sports team has issues, has problems, whether it's individual problems, you know, a player goes home and, and has an altercation with their partner or they've got family problems or they've got financial problems or there's team problems or tactical or technical or ego 
financial. There's always issues. So, you know, and again, it doesn't matter what age you coach, the issues are always there. And it's about, you know, again, trying to find the best solution you can in that moment for that group. You know, the best managers, the people who have been in the game the longest, like, you know, a Wayne Bennett or a Craig Bellamy in rugby league. I don't know if you guys follow rugby league. Alex Ferguson at Manchester. We only love football, Alan. And like people have been involved at the highest level. Klopp's already been at Liverpool for five years. So people have been at clubs for that long, have had to, you know, manage that whole scene and keep everyone motivated for a long time. And you can see the success that they have, that they've built and their imprint uh, clearly on, on those groups that they have. And, you know, since... And I hate Manchester United, by the way, but you can see <laughs> since Alex Ferguson left, um, they haven't won a thing. So how did coincidentally they win so many Premier League titles and major tournaments while he was there over 20 years? They were basically in the top two or three every year. And then he leaves and all of a sudden they don't get there. So obviously that coach in that environment found ways to find success over a long period of time through so many different squads. You know, it wasn't the same group of players. He rotated the squad so many times, but was always successful. So whether it was recruitment, whether it was talent ID, whether it was discipline, whether it was culture, whether it was leadership, whether it was tactical or technical or fitness or whatever it was, he found a way to keep the club successful. And they are really, you know, the people who, who have, have mastered the art. And Klopp's only been at Liverpool for five years, but, but you can already see he's his definite imprint on the team, both on and off the pitch. And, you know, I watched Liverpool Leeds on the weekend and it was probably the highest tempo match I've ever watched in my life. And just to watch two coaches who have such a definitive uh, philosophy on the game and one that I really love as well was just a fantastic advert for our game. Is that a bit of an exclusive, Alan? Is the Mariners going to be man-marking <laughs> next season? Uh, well, there's been a fair bit of that in my teams in the past anyway. So, you know, I've been a Bielsa fan for a long time. So... I'd have to say he's probably, of all the overseas coaches, probably been the most influential. You know, even at the Matildas, we, we were one of the highest pressing teams in the world and, and modelled a lot of our behaviours and our tactical discipline, especially without the ball, off, off a lot of his tactics, for sure. Stag, um, I was wondering, as just, you know, a fan of the game, what does, like, a coach like yourself, like, what's the imprint you initially come in with to a club like the Mariners and into the dressing room? Like, what do you initially try to imprint into the club and the team? Yeah, that's a that's a good question because I've, <laughs> I've only ever gone into an environment like that once in my life, and that was last year. Uh, before that, you know, as I said, I'd been at Hill Sports High School coaching their football program for 13 years. I was at the New South Wales Institute of Sport uh, coaching the elite girls there for about 12 years. I was at Sydney FC W League for seven years with the Matildas for five and even in and around that team for about 10 or 12 years. So I've never had that experience before. So for me, even at, at my age last year at 45, it was the first time I'd ever had to go into an environment that I was totally unfamiliar with. You know, coaches get sacked for a variety of reasons. But in that in that moment, it was the team had won one game out of the, the first 21 games of the A-League. So, you know, to go into an environment where the team had been losing um, and not getting points and not getting wins consistently throughout a season was, was tough. And, you know, my own emotional state was tough at the same time. You know, I'd just been fired from the Matildas. So I found... I found a lot of solace in the fact that we were both in a similar similar spot, you know, that I was I was at rock bottom during that period and so was the club and we both had to find a way together to, to try and, you know, lift our spirits. For me, it only comes through working hard and, and being disciplined and doing everything you can in that moment. And, you know, there's no magic wand to, you know, getting results in a football match. You have to do the hard work and then you make your own luck on the weekend. And luckily for me, we had we did have a stroke of luck where we made our own luck, but we did have a bit of luck in the first game. We played against Newcastle and it was a memorable F3 derby where, where we won and that just really, really gave everyone a lift. So in that respect, it was because re really, you know, I had three sessions with them. You know, it's not, they're not magical sessions that all of a sudden the team can turn everything around. But you know, sometimes, yeah. as you know, with a new coach, there's a new motivation, there's a new energy and, you know, the players took took some things on board and, and applied it and, and, yeah, it was a memorable game. But the result of that game was, was excellent because it really did yeah. give a springboard for the last four or five matches of the season and, and laid a bit of a platform for for, you know, the following year.
We're still not happy you beat victory twice. I wasn't counting, was yeah. it? Was it? Oh. <laughs> um, I was going to... S- um, Stage, I was going to say, was that a motivating factor that um, both you and the club were at a similar level in at this at that time, and um, just to the only pretty much, I'm just saying, like, was it motivating that the only way was up basically for you and the Mariners when you guys came together? Um, you cut out a little bit there, but I guess you're saying was it motivating that we're both um, sort of in the same same sort of mindset? Um, but yeah, it was. It was definitely, um, you know, I love, I'm very competitive and I love winning, but not just winning in terms of a scoreboard. I love winning in terms of just improving and getting better and, and seeing things that are small wins as well as actual result of the win. Um, so, you know, when we don't win or when we lose, I'm extremely reflective and down and try and find ways to, to address that. But yeah, it really was a big motivating factor. I wanted to get out there and, and try and do the best job I could both both for the club and for myself. Um, the club's been in a pretty, in a pretty, um, I guess, how could I describe it? It's been in a pretty tough circumstance for, for six years now where we've been at the bottom of the A-League and, you know, we didn't have the best season again this year. So it's just an extra year uh, where we've been down the bottom. But But I did think we... We, we at least plateaued and, and started to sh- show some uh, green shoots of improvement and, um, you know, got as many wins as what we have in the last five or six years. We had eight wins this year if we include the FFA Cup. So the club hasn't won. Semi-final, Alan. Yeah, we probably should have won that game as well, to be honest. I thought we were the better team and and um, Simo got a red card and, and you know, I think it was about the 65th or 75th 70th minute and they scored almost a minute after and then scored with a minute to go. I think Riley McGree got one. But but overall, you know, we had a bad trot through the middle there just before the COVID break. But, you know, post-COVID, I thought we came out and showed some real resilience and, and, and the newfound energy. And, you know, I don't want to talk about that Melbourne victory win again. Oh, but... no, stop it, Alan. <laughs> But no, it does give it does give the it does give the club a lot of uh, hope and, and renewed hope. Um, but we can never take anything for granted. It's just hard work, and and we know how much harder we have to work. But I do think we've laid a good platform. There's seven or eight kids in our team who played a lot of game time this year. Um, a lot of those kids just came in on a trial, uh, went from trial to scholarship, uh, from scholarship to proper A League contract to playing lots of matches and, you know, Sammy Silvera's come in from nowhere to all those parts in the process to now being sold to a Portuguese first division team. So, you know, that really gives um, me and the club a lot of hope that we can be a good platform, not just for our club, but also for young players to come and 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 develop and, and grow and, and, you know, prosper and be strong for our club over a long period of time. And, and if they're good enough, hopefully go overseas and have great careers as well. So going off question about, uh, sorry, not your question, your statement about the players coming through, do you have the freedom to play with the youth or without any fear? Um, look, I, I, I just, look, I followed the A-League for a long time, um, obviously, and and even when I was coaching the Matildas and Sydney have seen the W League, um, the Mariners were built on giving people an opportunity. And I think they they possibly strayed away from from the, the foundations that built the club and made the club as successful as it was. And, and particularly when you don't have the biggest budget in the world, it becomes even more important to have a good good youth program for one and also give youngsters from any club the opportunity and... and you know, I think this year's A League was there was probably more opportunity for young players at every club, to be honest, not just ours. Um, but we were certainly at the forefront, along with probably Adelaide, to give as many young players a go as we did. And and you know that's certainly important to me. It's it's a big part of my philosophy. I want to give young Australians uh, an opportunity. After that, it's up to them. You know, no one no one was given a spot in a starting eleven. They they were given an opportunity to train with it. As I said, Sammy Silvera came in an open trial. There was 26 players there who turned up to the trial and, and he was the only one who got a scholarship out of those 26. And and within three months, he, he was playing and training so well that we upgraded him to a three-year A-League deal. So, you know, he did that through his performances and effort at training. Um, and, you know, he was one out of 26. The other 25 didn't. So 
but they were all given that opportunity. You know, we didn't know Sammy beforehand. I'd watched him play as a kid, but, you know, I, I had no close connection to him. So he, he just earned that spot through his hard work and, as I said, his perseverance and performance. And now he's over in, in Europe and been lucky to be given the opportunity to play in Europe. So it's definitely a, a key component of us as a club moving forward. Uh, we've, we've built a good platform this year with those eight, eight young players. Um, important around that is a core group of leaders um, and to really guide these young players both on and off the pitch. Um, and that's definitely going to be an integral part of our, our recruitment moving forward. It always feels like, Alan, there's this massive debate in the A-League whether the A-League is a development league like the springboard for Sammy Silvera or that it's a league to try and get bums on seats. I, I don't know where you stand on this as an actual coach in the system. Look, I think you can do both and, and every club you know, it's their prerogative to choose the direction of that, that club. Um, Sydney FC um, have been the most successful club over the last three or four years. And, you know, a couple of young players have come through um, their academy uh, into their first team, Joel King being one that, that springs to mind. Um, but they've also set up a fantastic academy uh, run by Kelly Cross. And I know Wanderers have got a fantastic academy run by uh, Ian Crook. And, and we've got a fantastic academy as well. So the important thing is, you know, and I'm sure all the other clubs do as well, but they're all the ones that are sort of, you know, close at hand, you know, around Sydney and around Central Coast. So um, the important thing is that these kids are given a good education and a good environment, good coaches. Um, and we're starting to see the results. Uh, Sydney FC sold Ryan Teague and, and a young Pepe on overseas. Um, as well after the Joey's World Cup and and we saw the Joey's play well at that Youth World Cup. So, you know, as to what that means for the A-League, you know, so many young kids got on the field this year and, and so many did well. You know, the Toure boys in Adelaide and Dorigo in Adelaide and uh, young Curter at Melbourne Victory I thought was excellent. You know, so many, are, you know, just off the top of my head, I can't even think of all the rest, but kids who were 17, 18, 19 years old coming onto the pitch and, and being showing that they can play at that level. And, of course, with kids, you're going to have ups and downs and, you know, they're never going to hit the ground running and be unbelievable every game, so long as they're given that opportunity. Up to, after that, it's up to them. And, you know, young Kakache in, in Wellington as well as another young player we saw super at Singh last year. Um, for me, the, that's an important component for the league. And, and as a fan, I want to go and see young and aspiring Australian talent come through. Yeah, I want to I see. Good we play. all do. I don't care. I don't care what yeah. age. If it's a thirty-year-old, if you know, if Ibrahimovic comes and plays, I'm going to watch. If it's um, you know, a youngster who I haven't watched before and he's impressed me, I'll go and watch. So ultimately, I just want to see good footballers. But I definitely think the A League needs to needs to you know have a really strong focus on promoting young Australian talent. And you know, Wellington have done it and reaped the rewards both on as as having good players in their team, but also getting good transfer fees in the process as well. Uh, recently, James Johannesson said on an interview with Lucy Zalic that in the A-League, of the match minutes played by each age group, it's actually the age group of the 32-year-old that has played the most matches in the last five seasons. How challenging is that for a coach to balance the youth with the results and matches played? Well, as we know, it's a it's it's a pretty cutthroat job um, in the A League. So, as I said, you play too many kids, and 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 with young players, they're they're erratic. They they're just learning their craft. It's they they're gonna have good games and bad games, and good moments and bad moments. And and if you take a risk, there, there's a potential for you to lose the game, lose your job. Um, so that's. That's the balance and the equation for every coach and every club. You know, it's it's their prerogative to choose the direction of their club. Um, you can see clubs who have got older rosters, um, Perth Glory, for example, but they made the grand final last year. I think they're minor premiers as well. Um, we're in the finals this year, um, so good luck to them. That's the that's the direction that that club's heading in, and. And if they want experienced players and want to go out there and try and win matches with experienced players, we saw Diamante come in. I don't think anyone's complaining that a 36-year-old has come to our league. I love watching him play. Uh, I think he's brought a new energy and vibe and, and unbelievable skill level to our matches. And 
I shouldn't say it as an opposition coach. I love watching him play. Like, just he's just a fantastic ambassador for football um, and, and our A League. And to have that kind of quality in our A League, I don't really care how old he is, to be honest. And Ber- you could put Bess up uh, Berisher in, in the same category. You know, they they're fantastic footballers and and play with energy and heart and skill. Um, and they should be they should have an opportunity. And could you imagine the guidance they're providing to all the young players at Western United. So to have a good coach is one thing in, in Rudin, but to have leaders like that on the pitch who are so experienced and, and motivated and determined is a whole a whole nother thing. And, and you know, Western United are lucky in that in that fact. So for me, age is, we focus too much on that. It should really be on quality and performance and what they can bring to the whole league and that club, uh, you know, as a starting point. It's a double-edged sword really, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. definitely. Yeah. And going back to... Why we're all here today is to find out about the role of an A-League coach and what are the main challenges do you find during your week of coaching? Oh, look, there's lots of things to weigh up uh, week to week from, you know, your upcoming opponent, reviewing the previous game, uh, dealing with injuries, uh, planning sessions, uh, planning workloads, uh, monitoring players, monitoring staff, getting everyone together on the same page. Uh, working out travel itineraries if that's required. Um, there's just you're yeah. not in charge of that, Alan. You're not off to flight center. No, no, we're not off to flight center. But we we all have an input into what we want. You know, when you go to a restaurant, what you're going to eat, when you're going to eat, what time you're going to eat. So um, they're all important factors in preparing for a match. You know, uh, you know, from the nutritional requirements to times of the day, and and when you're going to fly out. You know, it's the Central Coast. I don't think people appreciate, and I do now, I didn't before, um, how hard the travel is from Central Coast on an away game. I think Perth, without question, have the hardest away schedule of travel of any team, but but I think we're, we're a very close second. Uh, we're an hour and a half away from any airport. So first of all, you've got to go on a bus for an hour and a half before you fly anywhere. So we're talking travel days that, that can last anywhere for from six to eight hours just to get to an away game. Um, so, you know, that presents its own challenges. So there's lots of things to think about in all that, you know, find, trying to find the ways to, to keep the players comfortable and ready and, and prepared and, and all those kinds of things. Because ultimately everything revolves around giving them the best opportunity to perform. Um, does an A-League coach have much say, or just a coach in general have much say in transfers, players coming in, players going out? Is there much say there or is it more towards the board and... So, what, yeah, that's really the big question. Like, that's what we're trying to understand is in how these roles are played. Yeah, look, every club's different. I'd say every club around the world's different for that matter. Uh, some clubs um, have a club-centred approach where, where, where a TD at the club appoints the coach and does the recruiting. Could be a sporting director, someone like that. Um, definitely some clubs have board and, and CEO involvement. Um, and then there's other clubs where it's totally coach driven, uh, you know, so long as it's affordable. So, you know, you get the whole range, you get the whole range. And, and I, I think that that range probably exists in the A-League as well. Um, but you can see clubs who, who get their recruitment right. I, I, we've acknowledged that the Central Coast, um, even before I came in, that was one of their, their big issues. They thought that their recruitment had, had to improve. Um you know, I think most of the recruitment we did last year was actually pretty good. Uh, you know, lots of good players came in and actually added value to the squad. Um, but again, for me, it's just a platform and, and, and we've really got to add to it. But at our club, we have we have obviously, it's, it's relatively coach driven, but we do have a football committee and then we do have, you know, a CEO and an owner who, who have a major impact in decisions as well. And, and you know, all, all the other factors that go around recruiting, but but um, as I said, every club's unique and individual, and that can change from time to time depending upon the coach as well. But clubs like Barcelona and Ajax, who have that sort of club centered approach, the, the the recruitment's possibly done uh, influenced by a sporting director or a technical group, other than or including the coach. I was gonna ask that: is the recruitment in the A League, like on transfers, um, is it more fueled on data? Nowadays, like the Premier League, is the A League the same as that? With yeah. the Y Scouts and the Opta stats. Yeah, look, the Y Scout Opta, yeah. Yeah, look, everything everything plays its part. There's um you know, there's 
There's companies like Instat, which we use, which are a fantastic company. Uh, we're a little bit like Y Scout, but probably their big rival. But yeah, we use Instat. Um, so they've been really helpful for us. Um, but then, yeah, you've got all those other analytical, you know, companies that help. You know, for me, a big one is trying to find out about their character. So doing background checks and reference checks, reference checks on, on the personality of the player. Um, and finding out what their character's like and what are they going to bring, not just on the field, but off the field as well. Um, so er everything plays its part. How do you do that, Alan? Yeah. Check out with the player. Because I remember <laughs> Sir Alex Ferguson, he would ask a family member or he would go to the school and interview a teacher. How do you go about doing that? Yeah, it's a little bit harder with foreigners, but um, look, in, <laughs> in, in Australia, it's pretty easy. We've got a pretty good network from people in our club. We're lucky that in all our previous roles, we we got to span the whole spectrum of, of basically football in the country. But overseas, yeah, we, we find a way. We find people who have played with that player or know that player, previous coaches, um, whatever the case may be. But we definitely want an independent sort of verified check and, you know, find out as much as we can about the player. Because football is one thing, but, you know, when especially when you're coming to a foreign country, having that personality and and resilience to be able to come in here and, and, and perform well is, is another big thing. And I'd say less than half the foreigners who have come to the A-League have actually been successful. So, you know, it's not something that the league has actually been really successful at, especially with visa players. Is there almost too much technology and stats on football? Has it become almost too overly driven by data, would you say, Alan? Well, look, there's there's arguments for that. Uh, definitely, there's there's so so much information that we get, um, and then just trying to filter that information and how much information do you pass pass on to the player as well. Ultimately, you just want to improve that player so they can improve the team. But definitely, GPS data and and wellness monitoring and and finding out as much as we can about the player. But there is. There is debate about how much you need and what do you need and when do you need it. But for me personally, uh, any information is good information, but is it all black and white? Like, for example, GPS, you could run the most in a game and have the highest speed and the high speed meters, but that doesn't mean you played well. You could have been running because you lost the ball 10 times and had to chase back. You could have been caught out of position 10 times and had to chase back. So... You know, just looking at raw data doesn't really give you information about the performance nor what you can improve. It has to be matched to to other information. So, you know, video analysis and data and all that kind of stuff really should be focusing on trying to find out the elements that you can pick out that that give you a better picture of the player's habits, their performance, and then hopefully what you can do to make them better at training. I feel though coaching at, at a high level, it would just take such a toll on your family. I I know your lovely wife, Brenda, her Twitter handle is the football widow. In your vows, football. Yeah, it was actually. Yeah. <laughs> and what are the consequences of the game on on your family, especially, and, and the time that you get to spend with your two lovely kids? Yeah, she knew. She knew she was marrying into more than <laughs> just a person. Uh, yeah. You know, I've always been a football fanatic. Uh, again, whether it's watching, playing, coaching, it doesn't matter. So... But yeah, it does take its toll in terms of in terms of how how much you're at home, and even when you're at home, how much you can engage with family, and and that's probably the toughest part. You know, in the A League, at least you're domestic. In other jobs I've had, where you're traveling overseas and away from home for six or seven weeks in a row or two months in a row, it's it's tough, and you do it is a sac. It's not a it is a sacrifice, but it's a choice you make because it's a job you love. But yeah, it does take its toll, and you know there were definitely moments. There, especially when my kids were young, where you're not home and, and you have that guilt complex about not being there to help your partner and, and help them, you know, with, help the kids with whatever they need, schooling or, or their sports. So, uh, look, every coach goes through that and I'm sure there's lots of occupations where where people do have that similar sacrifices. But, again, there's a lot more good that outweighs sort of that possibly one negative aspect of the role. Is Brenda sick of you complaining about Instat? Or a player that you've found or you've discovered, she's absolutely wrapped for you. Yeah, yeah, she's pretty emotional. So, you know, she wasn't really a football fan before we got together, but she's, uh, yeah, she oh. feels she feels every kick now. So, you know, rides the highs and lows and the emotions of the game. So, yeah, she, she's nearly a convert. <laughs> 
That's what we love to hear. <laughs> oh, your son would almost be a, a mini football manager. Does he want to follow in your footsteps? Or is he trying to pick the team? Uh, look, he Does actually, he give you advice? No, he doesn't yet, but he gives me advice on everything else other than football, so I'm sure he will come as well. But uh, he actually picked his first fantasy Premier League team on the weekend, so... Yeah, but I beat Jeez, you're a tough days. parent. <laughs> you said famously once that in life there is always change. There is always things that don't go your way. But the people that deal with change become successful and ultimately live a happier life. So going off what that, how have you dealt with change in your coaching career and in life? As I said, um, I was pretty, pretty lucky with the jobs I had. I had a... a, a unbelievable amount of stability in the roles um, that I'd had as a coach. So there was almost no change. I'll, I've been involved in environments where I was there almost from the time those positions started to, to when I left. Um, you know, I was the first coach at the Hill Sports High School, I was the first Sydney FC W League coach. So I was almost going in from start of the whole process to, to, to when I left after whatever, 10, 12 years. But um. I guess that quote sort of more relates to just resilience. I think that that's a factor that's decreased in our society, and especially with our younger generation. Um, you know, having been a coach for 20 years now, 25 years nearly, you know, I think the kids coming through now have less resilience than than possibly generations before them. You know, there's a lot more excuses and not taking accountability for their actions and and finding a way to bounce back. It's tough, you know, it's tough because, you know, even, even when you look at football, we've brought in so many rules um, to make to make junior sport better, and, we, and we've done a good job at that, I think. You know, things like reducing the size of the field, um, equal game time, you know, more touches on the ball, more actions on the ball. So everything we've tried to put into football is to try and give those kids a better chance of, of being better footballers. But when you even just look at not keeping score, and not that I'm an advocate for that anyway, but, uh, but you know, I'm still, I'm still torn a little bit from not keeping score and equal game time, which are the right principles for development, but you do lose a little bit of natural resilience. Uh, kids don't get to feel the pain, you know, of a loss um, you know, sometimes when I see kids crying after a game when they've lost 2-1 in a grand final and the kid might be 11 years old, I actually like seeing that sometimes. I like the fact that they care that much. I like the fact that it meant that much to them, that they were that passionate about the result and it didn't go their way. And I, I think that they're, they're the stepping stones to, to building character and resilience. And, and we've taken a lot of those things away. Um, you know, equal game time as well, which is, again, the right principle, but why are you getting equal game time? Have you earned that equal game time? You know, and you get to an age at whatever now, say let's just pick a number. Let's say you're 16 years old and you're on the bench for the first time and you don't get to play. Well, how do you deal with it when that's the first time that that's happened to you? And then all of a sudden you're in an A-league team and the coach doesn't pick you for three or four weeks. You know, it's a, it's the first time they're experiencing real life um, and, and real life situations within a sporting context. And, and I guess you could... You could parallel that to other other parts of our lives as well. But, you know, you need the people who have become the most successful in my journey, the ones that I've seen that I either played with or coached, weren't necessarily the best players at 12 or 13. And, and I'm sure every player who you would talk to would say that there was kids who were amazing at 13 and 14 and 15, and by the time they were 19 or 20, they were out of the game. And then on the flip side, there would have been kids who go, wow, he couldn't even make our school team at 15. Wow, he was he was our worst player in the under fifteens. Didn't make our under fifteens team or sixteens team. And I think Timmy Cale was one of those who didn't make an under fifteens youth league team here in Sydney. Ended up going to Everton and was our greatest soccerer. So, you know, he left home and went to a whole foreign country and had to fight bitter winters, loneliness, and and all that stuff to become the player he was. And you know. The more examples where we put kids in situations where they have to, to um, bounce back, I, I think the, the stronger they're going to be in terms of character. And, and, you know, and that's, that's what I was talking about in terms of change. We, you know, the, the best players are usually the ones who, who have found more ways to bounce back from more different situations, both, I guess, 
in football and in their personal life as well. So is it almost more challenging if you're an under 16s youth coach trying to manage the egos compared to an A-League dressing room where the players ultimately are going to accept where they fit if they're a starter or a non-starter? Yeah, I just think every team's different. Every under 16s okay. team will have its own characters in there and they've all had their journey to get to that team. So to say every 16s team is the same would be wrong. You know, to say every A-League team is the same would be wrong. You know, Sydney FC or just we talked about Perth Glory who uh, have, you know, a lot of 30-year-old players or, or higher. Um, That's different to my team. So, you know, you're dealing with Fornaroli and Castro and and uh, Kilkenny and, and players who have played all around the world and, you know, nearly perfected their craft versus, you know, a group that's got more younger players. So, yeah, I don't think you can just put a blanket rule over every 16s team or every A-League team. I think it's more individual than that. I was wondering what's some advice you could give to players on the fringes of making it to the first team? Because I have a cousin who's um, in that position at the moment with an A-League club and what would you give advice to him and other players in that position to push through and get that advantage to get into the first team and make an impression to the coach and to the yeah to everyone at the club basically? Yeah, look, I think I just touched on it. Uh, I think the players who show the most character will, and, and strongest mentality will ultimately give themselves the best chance. There's no guarantees of anything in, in football. Um, but the ones, you know, the ones who aren't breaking through and give up, well, they're not going to be successful. The ones who are on the fringes and persevere and find a way, whether it's through hard work, whether it's through discipline, whether it's through doing extras, whether it's through asking the coach what they need to work on, whether it's what's my weakness, I'm going to make it better. What's my weapon, I'm going to make it better. How am I, when I get my chance in that first team, how am I going to make sure that I make the most of that opportunity? They're the people who succeed. You know, they're the people who give themselves the, the maximum opportunity of, of success. And again, they're not always the most talented. They're, they're the ones who found a way to push themselves mentally, physically, technically and tactically to a level that others didn't. And when they get rejected, they fight back. Uh, they don't give up, quit, blame, become a victim, all that stuff. Did you see those characteristics in your team when you walked in day one in Gosford? Um, yeah, look, I, I think there was, look, there, the club had not been successful for six years. so That's why I thought because their confidence would have just t- taken such a battery. Yeah, and that's normal. That's normal. You know, and to be honest, mine did this year as well, you know, and I had to reflect on that and, I, and I, you know, it was something that I spoke about. I reflected on myself and with the group, you know, when we came back after COVID about how well we didn't manage that losing trot um, as a group uh, and, and me as a coach and as a leader. Um, so, you know, I think that's part of learning as well. You know, no one knows all the answers all the time, but but if you're honest with yourself and 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 do that evaluation process and, and reflect and find ways to do things better, you'll ultimately improve the next time that situation arises. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And I always think that people don't really understand the kind of pressures that you actually go through, Alan. And, and we, we kind of feel for you because, you know, you've got a lot of control and a lot of responsibility on your shoulders. But what would you be glad people knew about coaching and, and being a, a manager in the A-League? Um, look, that's a that's an interesting question. I guess for me, I, I think I've touched on it a number of times tonight. It's just a privilege. Uh, there's only, I, I still think I was extremely lucky and fortunate to be given the role. Um, there's only, or there was, 11 A-League clubs last year. Uh, there were three or four foreign coaches. So there was only seven you know, Aussie coaches in the whole country who who had the privilege of being in charge of an A-League team. So, you know, I counted myself very lucky. Um, you know, we've got some fantastic Australian born and bred coaches and, you know, and they've all had a different journey to get to that point and my journey is definitely different to, to the rest of theirs. Um, but it's just a position of privilege when, when there's so few. There's so few yet so many people would want that job. So... You know, you really got to embrace the fact that it's an opportunity, um, you know, and, and a position of honour that, that you have to treasure, and, and I certainly do.
and who knows where the journey will lead. Will, will you one day hope to, to be in green and gold as a Socceroos manager? Uh, look, my first goal is to try and uh, get the Mariners to the top of the table. So, Skip way you know. too far ahead of myself here, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alan. <laughs> uh, look, again, again, I've had, the pri- I've had the privilege of being able to coach my country and being in charge of a national team for five years and, you know, I had the young Matildas for four or five years as well and an under-17s national team. So, uh, I've, you know, I've had a fortunate journey through whatever, through a bit of luck, through hard work and being at the right place at the right time. So, I, you know, I understand what it's like to actually listen to your national anthem and the hair stand up on the back of your neck when you're out there at a match. So, you know, it's a great feeling and a great experience and, you know, there's not many people who have had the, the, the opportunity to do that. So in that respect, I count myself pretty lucky. But getting the Mariners to the top of the table is the, the first objective. Yeah, look, um, yeah, I guess I guess um, oh, I just got into coaching because I love the game. So as to where the journey was going to take me, I didn't really know. You know, I just always wanted to do my best and wanted, again, going back to those same things, wanted to compete and wanted to learn and, and help the people who who were there in my environment get better um, and hopefully enjoy the game as much as I did. Um, so I think for the most part I've been fairly successful at that. But this year was was by far my biggest challenge. And, you know, I look back on the year and I, I probably learnt more this year than I have in the last 15 or 20 years, both about myself and my coaching. And, and um, you know, I really look back with, with almost – almost um happiness that it was it was such an enjoyable year yet it was the hardest year of my life and the most losses I've ever had in my life just because of you know how much I think I learned um as I said about those two things about myself and about my coaching we are so grateful and so appreciative for you to come on tonight yeah no. Alan, thank you for for being with us no pleasure nice meeting you again You've been listening to the Glad You Knew Football Show. Keep up to date with everything Glad You Knew by following us at Glad You Knew on Insta, Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn. Don't forget to check out our Glad You Knew Politics Podcast released every Friday with Nathan Ang and I on all your favourite podcast platforms. 